If you ever go across the sea to Ireland Then maybe at the closing of your day You will sit and watch the moon rise over Clado And see the sun go down on Galway Bay For sure. You have a good history on the Clatter, Tommy. Okay, um, well, Tommy Holland's my name. I was born in the Clatter. I was a home birth in 1951. Um, my family, my mother was all told from Rope Walk. Now, there was only two streets in, in the Clatter had a name. That was Rope Walk, which was Rope Walk and Dogfish Lane. My, my mother was born in Rope Walk in the Tash Houses. I was born in Clatter, a home birth in 1951. And Nan Tool, this woman here, she she actually delivered me. This is my grandmother here from Rope Walk, Nantou. Um, like I said, I was born in 1951, and I'm involved in the history of the old Cadda, and have been since I was a child, really. Um, Cladda goes back. The first recorded recordings that we know of of the Cadda was when uh, they say Saint Inda sailed into the bay, and he was mm. met in the bay by two young boys in a boat, and they offered him bread and water. They are, and he asked where they were from, and he, they pointed in the direction of the Clada. Clada really means, if you translate, Unclavach translates in Irish into English as Unclavach, it means stony shore. Right. And how the old, from what I know, from my, my history of the Clada, the people who would have, who would have inhabited the Clada and inhabited the Clada going way back to maybe the 8th or 9th century, were the Fir Bullock, fight, fighting tribes of Ireland. Mm. They were the last of the fighting tribes, so they would have come there, made camp, they had, they had fresh water from the lake, they had, they had a bay, so they had fishing, they had hunting, and they'd have settled, moved away, settled, they moved away and come back, and eventually they started to settle and stay there. That's how the Cladda came along. Right. That's how the Cladda uh, originally became a village. And eventually the Fir Bullock stayed. They were a fight, the last of the fighting tribes. So the, the Clatter people were originally descended from Fir Bullock. Fir Bullock translates from, from Irish as, well, you, you couldn't trans, translate it as Fir Bullock, fat bellied men. Fir Bullock. Right. And the reason that being was they carried a, a, a kind of a leathered wallet with tools or weapons in it. Okay. So that's where Fort Bullock came from, the line of. Um, I can trace my own family, the O'Toole's. My family in the Clatter would, would have been O'Toole's, Connellas from Connemara, um, Connellys in, in, in English. So you have O'Toole's, Connellys, and O'Brien's. On my mother's side, we have O'Brien's and Connellys. My great grandfather was a man called Martin O'Connell. He came in from a. He came in from the islands. He came in from Wainish in Kauna, and he met my great grandmother. He was a boat builder from Wainish, and he met my great grandmother. She was Bridgie O'Brien, and they married. So this woman here, like I showed you, she's Anya Nicanella. She was born Nanny Connelly, mm. and um, so that's where the Connellys and the O'Toole's come along. Uh, uh, we see you show me some pictures there. Uh, yeah, this, uh, I'll just show you these here now. This one is my grandmother. This was taken with the first colour cameras in 1913 by uh, the Albert Can Museum in Paris. So this is my grandmother, Annie O'Toole. This is her daughter, Main Tool. That's her daughter. Uh, her daughter, and they were taken in May 1913. And the old shawls. And the old shawls, yeah. Old shawls. What they're wearing here, this isn't the shawl, this is this is a Galway cloak. It's known okay. as a Galway cloak. But this photograph here with my grandmother again, is, this is what's called a housekeeper shawl. It was a short shawl that they wore around the house or going to the shop. Keep that up there, don't tell me. Yeah. Look at that. And the woman with her is a Mrs. Jordan from the Cladda. She lived... Roughly where the grotto and the kind of church is today in attached house. But her family are gone. They have passed many, many years ago. There's no family left of Mary Jordan. So that's that's my grandmother again, Annie O'Toole, or Annie Nicanella. And this is Mary Jordan. So those are those, those photographs. 
Um, getting back to the cladder again. Um, I was taught a story a while back by a good friend of mine from the cladder, Michael Connelly. And Michael was telling me that the cladder was paved with cobblestones way, way back. And the reason it was paved before that, there was no paving. It was very, very primitive. And mm. the reason it was paved was a good many men fought at the battle of Trafalgar with the British. And in thanks for that, they say uh, he was an officer with, with, with the British Navy had, had the cladder paved. That's part of the history. Wow. And that's, why, that's where the paving came along. Now again, getting back to the men in the cladder, um, during the First World War, cladder put out more men for the British Navy than any village in Europe of its size. We put out more men for the British Navy than any village in Europe for size. They had hundreds of men sailing. But, I mean, the cladder men sailed with the British Navy ever before the First World War. You know, my own grandfather, Michael O'Toole, and I'll just show you a picture of Michael O'Toole. This is my grandfather. Sorry. Um, it's here. I'll just show you this. That's my grandfather, Michael O'Toole. That's your grandfather. That's my grandfather, yeah. What was he doing there, Tom? Yeah, well, he was just spending it. But he left the village as a very young man. Uh, we think he had uh, fallen out with his father or with his family. And he sailed. We know he joined the British Navy, but he, he didn't stay too long. And he sailed He sailed um, on immigration ships to the States and back, and he fished in Newfoundland um, as a young man. Um, he came back then and he had money and he bought, two, he, he seen my grandmother, which is this woman here, and he inquired who she was. He, he'd have been about 29 at the time, she was only 16. And it was a match made, it was a match she was sent for and she was brought back to the attached house in Rope Walk. And she was told that um, this is the man you're going to marry. And she married him, she was only 16, he was, he was 29 going on 30. But he had money. And he bought two boats. He had two glow jokes, two clad hookers. Yes. And he, what they what they would do was, if they had two boats, they'd fish one, and they'd rent the other one out. Okay. And they got a share of the catch from that. So at, again, that's Annie O'Toole, and this was her husband, Mike O'Toole. Now they say, I don't know how true it is, but they say, I kind of look like him, or I, I, I favour him in looks. I don't know. I would say I'm better looking than him, but anyway, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> but that 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 is my family. And the history of the cladder hasn't even been told. Unfortunately, um, the history of the village has been told in book form by people from outside the village. And that's not a bad thing. Mm. But if, if you go to people in Cladda and ask them about their family or ask them about their history, they'll shy away from you. Why is that? Well, going way back, Cladda people tended to be very, very shy. Believe mm. it or not. In Cladda, before the turn of the switch or the 20th century, you couldn't walk into Cladda. If you wanted to come into Cladda, you, you would come to the end of Wolfram Bridge and you would stand. And someone would come and ask you, what's your business? You could not come into the village of Cladda so that's and, and approach a woman. Right. You were, so that's why the King of Cladda? Yeah. Right. He decided okay. everything. And wow. you as a stranger, if you were working from the village, you could not come into that village and approach a woman or speak to anyone. You would wait at the end of the bridge and you would be asked your business. And if your business was, um, if they decided you had business in the village, you would be brought in and your business done. Were, so you but if you attempted to come into that village, if you walked into the village, asked, you, you, you were in serious, 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 serious uh, physical danger. I've never heard that story. They would only speak to you. And same way on the bay, they spoke a very, very guttural Gaelic. And they even say that even the Connemaras couldn't understand that they spoke so fast. And one man was asked many years ago, an Englishman said to him, why he said, when I speak to you in English, why don't you answer me in English? And his answer was, the answer he was given was, well, if you speak to me in English and I answer you back in English, you're as wise as me. But if you speak to me in English and I answer you in my language, I'm one up. I, I'm one up on you. 
So that's why they would never speak to you in English, going way, way back. They wouldn't tolerate you. They'd just totally ignore you. And my mother, as a, uh, when I was a child, had beautiful Irish. But again, on my mother's side, on my mother's side, her family came from Clada and Connemara, which most Clada families did. Yes. They intermarried between Connemara and Clada, yes. or Clada and the Aran Islands. Or, the, or as they call them, the islands along Connemara, Wainish and all those places. Again, my, my great-grandfather was Martin O'Connell. He came in from Wainish. So, Clada people, they married among themselves, but they also married Connemara and the Arden Islands. Very, very unique because they would only answer you or speak to you in Irish, but yet the women could go into the town to sell the fish. And they were wide. They, they were wide to everything. They mm -hmm. had perfect English. They were an island people. Mm -hmm. The people and who were unique. If you take the Blaskets. They lived on the outskirts of an island of people. Are so a and they interspersed between that village and so the town. But the town wasn't allowed to come into the village. They were allowed to go out. Or they would go out. So they were very wide. They were, they were very, very smart people. They were great business people. Yeah. So the market was it was up there, was it, uh, a Spanish arch there? Was yeah, it, that's where the fish market was held. Yes. Yes, that's where the yeah, fish. Well, <coughs> you see, when the boats came in, from once a boat came in, the men would unload a fish up on mm. the the pulleys on on, on the mast onto mm. the quayside. They would then run up, pull down the sail, and run up the nets mm -hmm. on the mast to dry them. That was their job finished. The woman then took over. She gave the man his money for his tobacco or his whiskey. And he went home, he minded the kids. They say clad men were great with kids, which they were, mm -hmm. because they minded the kids while the women were out. Mm -hmm. The women then <coughs> took the fish and sold the fish, that was their job. Mm -hmm. And there is a funny story told about my grandmother that uh, she used to have a drink with Parak O'Connor, you know Parak O'Connor? Yes, yes, yes. And he was teaching for a short time, <coughs> way, way back, I think about nine. 1910, 1912, in around that, he was, he was in the old Piscatoria school in the class of teaching. And when my grandfather, Michael O'Toole, this man here, when he would be out fishing, they would fish for between two, three, four days on the bay. Mm -hmm. And they'd see the boats coming in. So for once they seen the boats coming in, all hell broke loose. In my grandmother's case, she had six daughters and one son. So this this girl here will be will be sent with her. The other two girls will be given the, the younger children to mind. Yes. But one day the boats were coming in, and Nan too sent her daughter Mayne down to the Piscatoria school to get the rest of the kids out. And she opened the door and burst into the classroom, and she said, "She said, Peg." Bina, Nance, come on, your father is in. And Parker Connor was doing something with Irish classes or Irish lesson or an Irish history lesson with them in there. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he said to my grandmother, to go out to her. And when she came into it, down to speak to him, they were speaking in Irish, and he, he kind of knew of her, had, had, had heard of her. But she saw her fish. At the corner of Eglinton Street. That was her place. That's her spot. That's where she sought her fish. You did not mess with that woman. I have the full contents of that woman's house at cottage. Some of it now is on show at the moment in the museum. Right. But we have a chair, and she always, it's, it's out here, she always referred to it as parking chair. My mother always slept in it during the daytime in, in the house. And the reason it was referred to as parking chair was Park O'Connor used to call to the house. Ro this woman's house in Rope Walk, detached house, and he lived in Salt Hill. He lived down at the, the lane beside the Bannerslow house. That's where his house was. It was only knocked in the eighties. But he used to call to my grandmother, and they were talking about. They were talking. Uh, Askelga, they were he he they were talking about Irish stuff, and he slept in the chair. He used to sleep in the chair, <coughs> and he slept in that chair on a few occasions. So we always knew that when we were children, it's part of King Cheer. So we have it up in the shed out there. I would wow. pay for the full money. And I've been offered money for it. Mm -hmm.
but we have the full contents of our of our tash house. Cheers.